Let's bring in Seth Stefano from the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy. Seth, good morning to you, and my apologies. I didn't know that you were holding. I'm sorry. No worries at all, Rob. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, you weren't you were not late at all. I just missed you. So you were, you were there the entire time. I, I don't want anybody to think that you're a tardy person. No, it's all good. I, uh, I enjoyed the explanation um, and, and would concur uh, with John and Matt on, on their explanation of like the, the difference between like a negative campaign and a good, strong difference of opinion on issues. Would you also agree keyword, that – Keyword being issues. Would you also agree that I have a ton of PAC money? I don't know that you have a ton of PAC money. I would have to, you know um, – you know, yes. think a little more on that or look into that a little bit more. Don't look too, too, too <laughs> deep. <laughs> uh, Seth, let's talk about the July revenue numbers for the uh, state of West Virginia. And uh, with income tax cuts kicking in, what that does to surpluses, we know that the, it will uh, reduce those uh, very large surpluses the state has had. But you have concerns uh, that go deeper than that, don't you? Yeah. Well, I mean, July 2023 revenue collections were the worst revenue collections uh, in six years, um, this is clearly um, the continuation of a kind of downward trend. Uh, we're getting close to beyond downward trend. We're getting close to a free fall in revenue. Um, and unfortunately, this is the very predictable outcome um, of taking, you know, a 20-plus percent um, reduction um, in, in one of the largest sources of revenue for our general revenue stream, which is the personal income tax, um, a progressive revenue at, at that. Right. So when you when you cut that by 20 plus percent, um, you simply just don't have um, the money that you used to. And this is a you know, this is this is very, very concerning. I think, you know, some of the actions taken during special session kind of reflect the fact that that lawmakers even um, know that the party's over, that the masquerade of this whole, you know, surplus this and surplus that and we have money coming out of our ears is, uh, is just about to be done. Seth, when I brought this point up last week after I'd gotten your press release, I asked Senate Finance Chairman Eric Tarr this question, and uh, while asking Senator Tarr that question, Delegate Mike Hornby was listening, and he texted me basically the same answer that Senator Tarr had given me, which is that the reduced surplus numbers from July really had to do with the timing of a payment that was made. Otherwise, the surplus number would have been much healthier and will be reflected in the August revenues do you disagree with that uh, i mean i i i think that we'll just have to wait and see um you know what i think kind of even more important than the july specific numbers um is the overall trend rob and that's what i can't stress enough to folks right what we saw across um you know fiscal year 2023 right which is the fiscal year that just ended right that's the one that ended june 30th of this year um was that because of you know, factors beyond our control, severance taxes, especially for natural gas, were through the roof um, and bringing in lots of money. However, in the second half of fiscal year 2023, basically, you know, starting in and around, um, you know, January, um, revenue started declining and started declining significantly, so much so that that, that huge percentage of the quote-unquote surplus, and I hate calling that because that's really not true, um, was generated in the first half of fiscal year 2023. The point I'm trying to make is, is that, you know, unless, you know, the rebound in August is, you know, to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars, what you're, what we're still seeing is a significant downturn of revenues over the course of several months. It just, you know, it, it, the trend is not, um, I, I don't think the trend is really up for debate at this point. John Doyle. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with Seth on that. There's another element here, too. Uh, I do think if it, if it had been done right, there was enough room in the budget for that 20% income tax cut. The problem is I think it was structured very poorly. Uh, because it was a straight percentage across the board cut, in terms of per capita, a much higher portion of that tax reduction went to folks in the upper income. And they, per capita, don't spend as much in West Virginia as folks down on the lower level. As you get down to the middle, there's a higher percentage spent locally and and way down toward the bottom, a much higher percent, which means that if you had structured it so that a higher percentage of it went to the middle and lower incomes, more of that would be coming back in the sales tax. 
people buying stuff here as opposed to buying stuff elsewhere, which would have smoothed out a little bit the the dent in the state revenue. Seth, you Can concur? I respond to that? Yes, please. Yeah, well, so I, I would I would respectfully disagree on the issues with my good friend from Jefferson on this one. Um, <laughs> but but what I would say honestly is that he he, he it, there's two things essentially. Um, and John didn't quite get at this, but I think he was getting there. Um, the, the the sales tax numbers were pathetic in July too. They weren't real good. Um, and this goes against what um, you know top ranking officials within the Justice Administration promised us um, was not going to happen. Right. Um, you know, the, the pe- folks from the revenue and tax, they came out and said, don't worry about revenue. People are going to go out. and They're going to spend all this personal income tax cut. The sales taxes are going to jump up. And we're, you know, we're well, not going to know the difference. Right? Seth, that I, did not happen. Seth, yes. I think that proves my point. And, and well, yeah, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm getting I'm getting to the second point. Right? Yeah, I, if, I, if I can just real, what I would propose um, instead of of cutting the personal income tax. I think tax policy for folks kind of on the, the lower income and the middle income range is, is best done when it, it, it is zeroed in on tax time. So, like, what I mean, like, you maximize the refund through things like an earned income tax credit for low-wage workers or a child tax credit for families. Those policies, um, as far as tax policy, can, can really, I think, zero in better on, on what John is talking about to give people almost like a lump sum around refund time that they do indeed go out and spend at that particular point. Well, and, so I, and, I guess, and that is a different vehicle to get at the same goal I have. And, and listen, I'm not an economist. Maybe you're right that that's a better vehicle than my idea. But, uh, yeah, I, I do think, I though, I, 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 I really am concerned about the fact that we are running out of money yeah. very, very quickly. And we have a lot of unmet needs. Oh, I agree with that. I agree with that completely. I, I just think that had this tax cut been structured more to get more money into the hands of middle-income people and lower-income people as opposed to upper-income people, you you would see the sales taxes decline less than they are. Matt Miller. When we look at the tax structure as a whole in the Mountain State and and where the tax money is coming in, where, um, Seth, do you think maybe there should be changes made that would get that revenue where it needs to be? That's an awesome question. Thank you so much for asking. Um, uh, you know, one of the, um, you know, especially unfortunate problems with the tax law that was passed in um, – the regular session earlier in, in January and February, House Bill 2526, that includes an automatic trigger um, wherein if revenues exceed, I believe it, it's all revenues, but you take out severance taxes, right? And so if revenues exceed what, you know, revenue was, I think it was in fiscal year 2019, I'd have to double check and make absolutely certain on that. But, you know, minus severance taxes, um, that any revenue that comes in over that automatically has to be put towards another reduction in the personal income tax. This is a real problem for multiple reasons. Um, you know, it, it, you know, it doesn't take into account, you know, inflation, um, things costing more over time, therefore, you know, sales taxes increasing to match that over time. Um, but that being said, that's kind of what we have to deal with. Um, and since severance taxes are not applicable to the trigger, I think right now um, the smartest thing to do is to, um, increase the natural gas severance tax, um, you know, three, maybe four times over uh, to make up the revenue that West Virginia needs. This is a highly exportable form of revenue generation. There are very few people inside the state of West Virginia that actually pay severance taxes at all, let alone natural gas severance tax. And I don't foresee anybody picking up that pipeline and moving it just because West Virginia decides to, you know, um, exercise our competitive advantage um, to make sure that we have a general revenue fund through our state budget that can provide for the needs of our people. And unlike the coal industry, the natural gas industry does not employ large numbers of people in its operations. It's it's a much more uh, 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 capital-intensive industry than the coal industry. Yeah, less, less yeah, labor. Let intensive. me uh, add something here. I just... Uh, Delegate Eric Householder, the majority leader, is listening, and he just texted me and said the calculation does include inflation. So inf- inflation is included in that. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Leader Householder, for, for clarifying that. 
Yes. Uh, but okay. I think my, my original point stands is that with the trigger in there, um, it, it, it becomes difficult to raise revenue in, in ways um, that aren't related to severance tax. Um, with this pipeline now being, I mean, the, the, you know, regardless about how you feel about the pipeline, and I have feelings personally, I just want to make that abundantly clear. The Supreme Court has spoken, right? Can we all be in agreement on that? Yes. Like the pipeline will be finished. Right. And that is going to put West Virginia, I think, at an advantage. Um, and I think I hope um, in, in, in good faith that, that lawmakers and the citizens of West Virginia kind of take stock of this and use this as an opportunity um, to make right um, what has held West Virginia back for over a century and a half. Right. Um, which is we we fail to take advantage of our mineral wealth. Right. Over time. And so now I think we're in a good position to do it like these natural gas companies aren't going to pick up and move that pipeline somewhere else, right? We could basically dictate, you know, the, the price of it, and we could have funding uh, to support the needs of our community. Well, Seth, the, the legislature, you pointed out the triggers, but if the triggers aren't met, then there isn't an additional tax cut that's invoked. So the, the triggers have to be met first, and the triggers wouldn't be met if the numbers didn't add up. That's true. That's true. But I'm just – what I, I guess that I didn't say, um, and, and, and I apologize for the confusion, if you try to raise revenue um, through means um, that could meet the triggers, then all you're doing is raising – and I think that you know what you're essentially doing is raising revenue to meet the triggers. So, like, if, if we came out and said, well, we're going to raise the sales tax by 1% um, to try and make up from some of the lost revenue of the personal income tax – I well, think my reading of the policy as it stands now is that any additional revenue raised through that would count towards the trip. Or, or if you uh, went by the one proposal that Governor Justice made a couple of years ago, which would have doubled the sales tax to, to, to a 12%. Right? Or, yeah, now all of a sudden, you, you know, your trigger is met. <laughs> yeah, right. So, like, we find ourselves in kind of this, this you know, interesting conundrum, or not interesting, bad conundrum at that, is that, we clearly need revenue to invest in our communities. Um, the staffing crisis across agencies isn't going anywhere, right? It, it, it's, it is continuing to, you know, have repercussions for our communities across the state. We have, you know, multiple unmet needs. Um, there is yet another class action lawsuit has been filed um, against the state regarding the condition of our jails and prisons. Um, you know, this state needs investment. Like we need to invest in, in, in things across the state, and I think one of the, the best ways to do that, we've maintained this for years at the Center on Budget and Policy. This was, we didn't just come around with it, but taking advantage of the fact that people have, or, or excuse me, people want what we have in the way of natural gas um, is, is something that we should we should absolutely take advantage of that, right? Did you have a follow-up, Matt? I was just going to ask, Seth, you mentioned earlier you, you really didn't like the term surplus, and, and I know from your appearances on this program before that you feel like you know the flatline budgets are not necessarily taking into account certain needs that are in the state of West Virginia that may not be being met. I, I wondered your thoughts on the most recent uh, special session and some of the legislation, the, the money that came out of that and where it's going in corrections and firefighting and so forth, uh, your thoughts, was that good? Was that at least a first step? Where do we go from here? I mean, I have, gosh, good Lord, how much time do we have? Um, <laughs> Eight minutes. You know, I, <laughs> <laughs> Who's counting? You know, I think, I think on the whole, um, I would identify some problematic things um, with, you know, certain spending line items or certain appropriations, as they call them, supplementals. Um, I am concerned about um, the legislature picking winners and losers when it comes to higher education, right? So you talk flat budgets. One of the one of the best examples that of the damage that flat budgets do um, is the situation at WVU right now, right? There are other factors. I think I've been I've been we have as an organization and I have on this program um, been upfront that there are other factors um, that have led WVU to find themselves in the situation they do right now. Um, but one non-disputable factor. One thing that is an absolute fact is that if the legislature had simply kept higher education funding up with inflation over the last decade, um, West Virginia University would have $37.5 million more to work with and would not be looking at a $45 million cut, but instead a $7.5 million cut. That is a product of flat budget, right? 
the thing that cost a dollar 10 years ago is going to cost you more this year. That's normal. That happens. Um, one of the big concerns I have when I look at some of the appropriations is not that I'm necessarily opposed um, to, you know, a new airplane hangar for Pierpont or not that I'm necessarily opposed to, you know, an investment in the cybersecurity program at Marshall University. One of the things that I am very concerned about, and I think should concern us all, is the legislature specifically inserting itself to pick winners and losers when it comes to higher ed, if, that's, if that makes sense, right? So it, one of the things about the special session that I think is concerning is that instead of putting money um, towards higher education generally um, and then charting a course um, so that so that these, you know, financial or these, these higher ed institutions, specifically the, the administration of these higher education institutions have some more accountability and oversight um, without drastic cuts to programs that really inhibit the ability of our state's land-grant flagship institution to provide a good education. Um, what, what we saw this session was, well, we're going to take 20-some million and put it towards Pierpont here specifically, and we're going to take 46 million and we're going to put it towards Marshall here specifically. Uh, I think that that is, I think that could be really problematic going into the future. I will say um, outside, I know that I'm, I'm running out of time. I just, I, I do want to say that I do think the legislature um, started moving things in the right direction with some of the criminal law reform bills you saw. I, you know, I do want to give credit where credit is due. Um, you know, Senate President Blair and others came out very early on. I've, I've heard them talk on this program and other programs that really salaries are just one part of the problem when it comes to staffing in our regional jails and correctional facilities, and they, they, did, they did push some initiatives um, to, to address some of those issues, and so I, I hope they continue to do so. But, um, you know, spending, eh, not really. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see the, um, the bonuses or, or pay scale improvements for some correctional workers um, doing the trick, to be honest with you. Um, I want to give a shout out to you know all the volunteer firefighters across West Virginia who really really did a great job applying grassroots pressure um, to get at least at a minimum um, that particular twelve million dollar line item in, inserted from my understanding which will be a permanent line item moving forward and so that was a that was a people's victory Rob and company and so I, I want to give them a lot of credit out there for that uh, Seth I need uh, this is John I need to push back just mildly on. Uh, all of the stuff that I'm hearing about that from down in Charleston related to higher ed, almost everybody focuses on West Virginia University. This is a problem with every state college and university. Uh, it is exacerbated, I think, at WVU because of some mismanagement, a greater mismanagement than is the case with Shepard and Marshall and West Liberty and Concord and, and, the, and the other schools. But the problem exists everywhere. They're all being told, you've got to cut programs, you've got to cut programs, which in turn is going to end up with fewer and fewer people even going to college. And I just think it, it's a downward spiral. Also, you made a reference to the WVU being the land-grant university. West Virginia has two land-grant universities. What's the other one? Uh, West Virginia State. West Virginia is one of 18 states. That, ha that have not only an 1862 land-grant university, but an 1890 land-grant university, a direct result of uh, uh, segregation in education. These are the 18 states that did not allow African Americans to go to their 1862 land-grant. And the Congress in 1890 said, fine, we're going to give you each another grant of land to, to uh, have another land-grant university that African Americans can attend. Thank you, John. Uh, 858, yeah. and Seth, before we wrap up, I want to clarify just a couple questions for you before we go regarding the financial situation of the state, as you understand it. And I'll send President Craig Blair on tomorrow morning, uh, by the way. Do you feel that the trend has already been established and financially, yes. and, and this Very is clearly. you don't think this is a one month anomaly. You believe this is a, a trend that's been established and has the state on the wrong side of of, uh, of good financial planning. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that the, when you look at the everything from the second half of fiscal year twenty twenty three tells us very clear this is a trend. Um, you know, the the money just is. And this is what I like. You know, prior to this legislative session, the personal income tax made up forty percent of our our general revenue fund. 
Like, what did folks think was going to happen if you cut over 20% of it, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, that, that is very easily proven by numbers. Like, this is not just a kind of a one-month thing. When you look from the second half of fiscal year 2023 up until where we are now, right, just not even two months into fiscal year 2024, we, were all, we are clearly on the downward slide. As this is early in this uh, fiscal year, do you anticipate this trend reversing as the year continues? Um, I mean, with what? I mean, like, I, I, like I, you know, this, this, you know, these revenues aren't going to come out of thin air, um, and I just I don't see how, um, you know, increased sales tax collections. Um, I, I just I don't, you know, we how do we say this? Trickle down economics just rarely trickles down, Rob. And I think that this is something that has been proven over decades and decades and decades, and that's what the personal income tax cut is. It is a tax cut that largely, largely, to, to the tune of two thirds, uh, benefits the wealthiest households in the state. Um, and it, you know, it, it was that's that's what it is designed to do. Um, and that this is going to come, and already is coming, um, at the expense of our public institutions um, and and you know unmet needs for West Virginia families and communities across West Virginia. Seth, we are out of time. How can people find out more about the West Virginia Center for Budget and Policy? Check out our website, um, wvpolicy.org, um, and I recommend the blog. Right, we've got a, there's a there's a tab right on our website that says blog. Um, if you want to know what we're kind of up to the minute researching and talking about, that's a great way to do it. Um, and if I have time, I have one more quick special session special session note. If I can end on something real quick. You have 20 seconds. <laughs> so um, there was a bill to basically take a bunch of money out of the rainy day fund. Um, and Delegate John Hardy, the vice chairman of the finance committee, killed that bill. And it was the right thing to do. And I know I come on here a lot, and I'm very critical of leadership. Um, I think rightfully so. Uh, but Delegate Hardy did the right thing in that situation, and I just I wanted to say so. So, there. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Rob. John, Matt, see you all later. See ya. Bye.